I'm starting. Okay, great. Oh, hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm Diane Willis. This is Chicago Ions, and we're, wonder we're glad to have you. I'm sorry we had a little glitch today getting started because, uh, because something happened with the uh, company we use to distribute the email, and I copied and put the Zoom link in, and it copied the old one, and I don't know why. I'm, I'll have to research it afterwards and talk to them and see if I can figure it all out. But meanwhile, I sent another email, and hopefully enough people will get it to, to one who is, I, well, I have complete faith, faith. I know whoever is supposed to be here is going to be here. So we'll just go with that and, and, and uh, appreciate it. We usually start our meetings uh, with a brief meditation. I play Native American flute, Bobby, uh, and I was gifted with that ability after my uh, journey to the other side. I had never uh, improvised anything before. Uh, on our website, chicagoians.org, it can point you to uh, the, the CD that I made and, and, and all of the music. People have reported being healed, even of cancer, by the way, David. Uh, by listening to that CD, it just totally stunned me. I, I had no idea when I was making that, that 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 could happen to anybody, but they do. So we're going to take a couple of minutes and start with a, um, a little quiet time here with meditation. So if you have things on your lap or anything, you might want to get rid of them and get yourself in a comfortable position so you can relax. So allow your eyes to gently close and, and go where you go when you go.
How did I get muted? How did I get muted? I can't hear you. I can't hear you, Marsha. You're, 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 you're. I'm, I'm, okay. There you go. <laughs> okay. I muted you for the phone call just to give you some privacy, and then I just. Oh, no, that was that was okay. I didn't have any problem. It was somebody calling to find out what happened, how, why they couldn't get on. Great. So hopefully they did. People, but people, people are finding it. We've got twenty-four of us yeah. now. Good and <laughs> growing. Little by little, <laughs> yes. So um, at any rate, uh, just a couple of brief announcements. Um, uh, one is that um, we had like two do two donations last month, and I I don't usually talk about the, the money situation because I like it to be available for everyone. And I don't want anyone to ever feel like they can't come because they don't they don't have the have twenty dollars to pay to join us. But um, I always feel that everybody knows what they can and what their fair what their fair share is, and uh, and that's what I expect that you donate your fair share. So if you have enough money, you know, we appreciate getting a little bit of it. Two donations don't pay our monthly expenses. And we have, we also support um, children in at the Shanti Foundation in Nepal. And it, we, it pays for everything. We pay a thousand dollars a year for them. And, um, and we want to be able to do that again this year. So uh, if, if you can help us, please do appreciate it. You go go to our website under donate and it'll tell you the different ways that you can donate to us. So, um, and now the other thing was, I just want to mention that next month we'll have Rhonda and Dave Ings, uh, who are going to, they're uh, therapists and they're both near death experiencers. And they've done a lot of interesting um, workshops and they will be ha having a presentation for us next month. So, so that you, no, wait a minute. December, yes, that's right. <laughs> Did I get it wrong? No, in January, we're having Jack Bonsick back. Jack is, is and I was thinking maybe he was December, but no, no, he's January. Um, Jack uh, had a, he was uh, doing mechanical things under a car and I just take time to mention it because it's so uh, stunning what happened to him. He was underneath a car fixing a car and the Jack failed and, and the car fell on him and he was paralyzed from the neck down. And when he was in um, uh, the hospital, he discovered he could talk to the cells in his body and release the paralysis. And he worked on himself for seven years and, and released the paralysis from his neck all the way down to his mid calves. And by the time after seven years, he, he was he could walk. It, it was a difficult because his ankles were still paralyzed and his yeah. feet. But um, he got braces for his ankles. He said, I've done this. I've long enough. And so he's the only person I know that's paralyzed from the mid calf down on both legs. I, I just find that such a stunning uh, example and, and to, sh to show you what the possibilities are and how extremely blessed we are and how really connected to the other side we are and, and he has a wonderful wonderful story so I wanted to make sure to mention that then <laughs> I'm so thrilled that we have Dave Bennett with us today uh, I've known Dave for years and years and been wanting to have him speak to us all this time and it just never has quite happened um, my guides are always the ones that choose our speakers and um, they they said with no under, uncertain terms when we started having these online. He said they said you know that Dave was definitely to join the crew, and we are so glad he did. So I'm going to turn this over to Dave and let him tell you all about himself and his experiences. He's had some wonderful wonderful experiences, and. Um, and you're going to do questions at the end. 
I believe. Yes. Yes. Dave. The questions. Are so please give a warm welcome <laughs> to Dave Bennett. All right. Diane, thank you so much. And um, and all the board of uh, Chicago Ions for inviting me. Um, it has been a long time. Diane and I have known each other for quite a while. And, um, you know, um, I, when I was going through my cancer, Diane, I, I did listen to your tape. I, you know, I, I, I think I have it on cassette. Um, but anyway, I've, yeah, I've, I've listened to your uh, music for quite a while. You're picking up from me. I don't, is, is, is anybody else have that? Pardon? I said, uh, I, I, I think maybe it's just my, my computer. I live in a hole and, oh. <laughs> and things come and go. Oh. All right, Marsha, am I cutting out or am I okay? No, you're fine, Diane. It's cutting out a little bit every so often. Okay, Dave, great. Good. Yeah, I just want to make sure. Um, so yeah, Diane's music is great, and and I and what Diane said about donations is really critical for all the IANS groups. Um, they need donations to keep them going, and um, and I know because I coordinate all the groups internationally, so. It's a, it's a huge, each group, it's huge what they do for their community. And, um, and I'm really honored to be here online, which makes it very easy, you know. Um, and so I'm, I'm really happy to be here. So I'm gonna start out with my near-death experience, which then created opportunities to have additional spiritual experiences and then how it helped me to overcome stage four lung and bone cancer. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So, uh, and then I'll, you know, try to, if you have a question, maybe jot it down so you don't forget it halfway through. I know if your memories are like mine, you know, it's like, oh, I had a question, but now I can't remember what it was I wanted to say. So, <clears throat> back in 1983, Going back in time, I was the chief engineer of the research vessel Aloha, and we did underwater exploration. It was a dream job for me because um, I grew up in a really kind of dysfunctional way. Um, my mom was a single mom, and, um, and it wasn't, wasn't really popular to be a single mom back in those days. And so she used to uh, kind of, I, I used to say she used to farm me out to other families and and so I I would live with one family, then another, then another, then another. And so I never really got the sense of of belonging. And um, and I, I grew up very self-dependent uh, or self-reliant. And um, and so, you know, I had a really, really I I call it a brash philosophy because I used to think, well, you know, I have to survive because there's nobody looking out for me. So, uh, so I, I used to think you have to cut your swath through life. And that's a brutal philosophy when you think about it, because it really doesn't include anyone else. It just, it's just you. And, and that's part of the illusion of this life, isn't it? You know, that we, we have this illusion that we're these separate individuals that are, you know, striving through life. Well, it worked really well for me, that philosophy. I became the chief engineer of a research vessel in my mid-20s. After you know serving um, serving in the Navy and getting my engineering uh, credentials and everything, so <clears throat> in March of 1983 we were evaluating a submarine. It was a an ROV, a remote operated submarine, and uh, and and the storm front came in, and so we were trying to you know button everything up and race into the harbor, our home harbor in California at the time was the Santa Barbara Harbor. And we were trying to get in there, but the harbor master refused the sentry because there were 30 foot breakers at the harbor entrance. So our ship would clearly bottom out um, because you know, we're, we're a good ship. We've got submarines on board and we're a 143 foot research vessel. And so, and, and that, that harbor is a very small little regional harbor, but the uh, harbor master refused the sentry. So, but we had some design engineers and stuff like that on board that really needed to get to LAX. So the captain decided 
to that we would shuttle them in on a um, on one of our zodiacs. Which, if you don't know what a zodiac is, it's it's those rubber boats that you see the Marines use for landing and stuff like that. It's very durable. We used to use it to retrieve our uh, our submarines and high seas. So, and we're all very well experienced, uh, you know, sailors and and mariners. So, you know, we weren't weren't overly concerned. But um, the captain asked me to go on this because, because we were just doing an evaluation trip. We didn't have a full complement of crew on board, but I was uh, the chief engineer, third officer, and I knew the harbor. And none of the other deckhands that we had on this trip really knew the harbor that well. So myself and uh, the engineers and, and one deckhand, we all loaded up into this, this, uh, this Zodiac. And we took a bearing, and this is at nighttime, okay? So it's middle of the night. And, but, and we're about two miles offshore because that's where the ship could stable, you know, be very stable even in a storm um, because you'd have those huge rollers that would, you know, you'd have rollers that would come. And, but the ship, you know, you just point the bow into the rollers and it rode it through really, really well because it's, it's a big ship. So we uh, we took a bearing on the on the harbor. We got in the zodiac and we started heading in. Well, you can imagine um, <clears throat> twenty five to thirty foot seas. We drive up on top of a swell, take a bearing on the uh, harbor buoy, which was going up and down in the sea. <laughs> And then we'd roll down the, the trough and up onto the next one and do it all over again. And so we were using that to try to make our way into the harbor. But the wind and the sea state, it wasn't very long before we lost track of the harbor boom. But the shoreline was all lit up. So we figured, well, worst case, if we have to, we'll, we'll do a beach landing. We'll get these engineers into the harbor and they can you know, get their transportation and head down to LAX. So we just started heading in for the beach. We didn't know it at the time, but the storm had blown us actually a mile south of the harbor. And we had only made it in about, we were about a mile, still a mile offshore. Well, there's a place there that they actually do a lot of uh, surf competitions because there's this groundswell there that creates these amazing rollers, you know. And with 25, 30 foot seas, we drove off of one of these uh, one of these waves. We just drove right off it, and we fell 25, 30 feet, and uh, and you know hit the bottom. And I screamed to the the mate who was uh, who was you know at the at the console to turn us about because I was in the bow trying to find, you know, figure out where on the shoreline we were headed. And, um, and so he went to turn us about, he got us just about turned around to head out back out to sea because we were a lot safer out to sea than in a breaker zone. And so then guess what, you know, right above our head was the next one. And it came right down on top of us. It folded the Zodiac in half. I like to say like a peanut butter sandwich. It just folded it in half. I was in the bow, and so it catapulted me into the sea, and I was tumbling and tossed in, in the ocean. Well, now, I'm trained as a commercial diver. Um, I've got thousands and thousands of hours under the sea, and so I'm not, not overly concerned here. But, um, and, and this one night, it just so happened that we had actually gone down to the bosun's locker and we had pulled out life vests. We never wore life vests on the ship. But this night, we actually went down, got the life vests for this little trip, this little jaunt into the harbor. And, um, and they were those old World War II uh, giant pillow type life vests, you know, the big orange. Uh, the, they were called May Wests. So I was really happy that I had May West on. And that I'm, you know, and I'm being tumbled and tossed by the sea, but I'm hanging on for dear life. But you can only hold your breath for so long. Now, as a commercial diver, I knew I could hold my breath for almost three minutes, which is a long time when you think about it, if I hyperventilate. I really didn't get much of a chance to hyperventilate before I was tossed into the sea. But I just, um, I'm hanging on for dear life. And, uh, and 
you start and, and trained as a diver, we go through oxygen deprivation training so that we recognize the symptoms. So I'm there and I'm like, oh man, I can feel it. The euphoria is coming on. And, um, and, and so you start thinking, and I started thinking, you know, is my insurance paid up? Um, you know, is my wife going to be okay? All those kinds of things are, you know, going across my mind because I knew I didn't have much more time before I was, before, you know, I was going to drown and I knew I was going to drown. And sure enough, I, you know, I never hit the surface. I never went up to the surface. So eventually you breathe in salt water. Actually drowning it's amazing. And when you talk to a lot of near death experiences, phenomena of when, you know, a violent death happens, you immediately just pop out of your body. And so that's what happened. I popped right out of my body and went into this blackness, this absolute blackness. And now you got to realize I was in this violent song, it, storm. It was the most violence I'd ever experienced in my life. And, and suddenly I'm in this place, it's quiet, it's calm. There's no more roar of the ocean. And I'm curious because in, in our diver training and oxygen deprivation training, it's like, I've never, you know, this is way beyond that. And so I, uh, I was curious, but it was interesting because I didn't really feel alone. I mentioned earlier how we always we always seem to feel like we're alone and we're just you know forging our life. I felt like I was connected to something so much greater. I felt like I was a part of something so much greater, but I was in absolute darkness. And it there was a richness in this in this void, as they call it in NDE research. So Eventually, I saw this speck of light, and when you know when you see a light, I mean, you just you just have to like look at it. And it felt like I was moving toward it, or it was coming toward me. There was wasn't a tunnel or anything like that. It was just this light, this pinprick of light, and I started moving closer to it. And as I got closer to it, I could see that the light was millions upon millions of fragments of light, and they were all in unison. It was like, um, if you ever seen a school of sardines that are swimming in the sunlight, how they, how they all just suddenly flash and go in one direction and the other, then you, you could imagine what this infinite millions of, of fragments of light, they were like they had one consciousness and they were all in unison and working together and multiple colors. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, and I started to take a look at myself and I realized I was transitioning into one of these fragments of light. And as I got closer, I started feeling these just waves. It was like I was being wrapped in a warm blanket of love. And it was like nothing I've ever, ever experienced in life. Like I said, my early days in, in my life, I was, it was pretty dysfunctional. And so to feel this love was just, it was overwhelming. I mean, I was in gaga awe of what was occurring. And so as I got closer and closer and closer, my, the whole horizon was filled with these lights. And, um, and three broke away and started coming toward me. And as they were coming toward me, it was very clear. The message they had for me was welcome home. And I'm sorry, it's been many years, but I still get emotional about the homecoming that they generated, the, the love and the acceptance that they, they exuded towards me was just amazing, absolutely amazing. And eventually a dozen of these light beings came toward me and I recognized them as family. And I call them my soul family because it just, I, I knew them and they knew me and they were welcoming me home and they were loving me and supporting me. Like I never felt anything like that in my life. And so we, they communicated to me and we went into the light, into this area that to me, it felt like this giant bubble, like a big sphere. We went in there and I started reliving my life. 
in the NDE research, I'm sure you're all aware, they call it the life review, right? Well, it was not just the review. It wasn't like watching a movie. It was like I was reliving it, but not only from my perspective, but it was like my consciousness fragmented into these multiple streams of multiple streams of consciousness. And I was experiencing it not only from my perspective, but from everyone I'd ever interacted with through their perspective. And so it was like I was create. there was every action that I would take would create these ripples and um, and these ripples would just cascade outward and I could see, you know, effects and after effects and things like that and the interconnection that we all have. And so it was, I was, I was kind of, remember what my philosophy was you cut your swath through life. So I did some things that I don't know, I, I wasn't too proud of. And I got to relive some of those moments in my life review yes. and um, where I had just walked over people and where I had um, just been very, very, very brash. And, um, and so I was ashamed, actually. I was ashamed because not only was I experiencing this, but my soul family were experiencing it the same way with me. They were with me. We were all experiencing this, this life review. And so I was ashamed that they had to see some of those more unsavory parts of my life. And but I also got to see moments where I would do something with loving intention without really, you know, looking for anything out of it, but I would just do something with, with loving intention toward another human. And when I would see, when I would relive those moments, the ripples were huge. They they actually took on much more of a after effect type of ripple that would, would cascade out. Sorry, I speak with my hands, so I hope it's not distracting. Um, brought up by, by Italians, I have to speak with my hands. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> so I'm going through this life review and, and I'm judging myself, but my soul family isn't. They're just supporting me. They're loving me. They're supporting me. And I was, uh, talk about humbling. It's probably the most humbling experience you can, you can ever really have. So I'm, I'm going through the life review and I get to the point where suddenly it's not anything that I'd lived. I didn't know it at the time, but I started seeing my future, going into my future. And at this point, once I crossed that threshold, everything in the life review up to that moment was crystal clear. And all the ripples and after everything was crystal clear. But when I crossed that threshold from my living life into a potential life, it was like I was looking down a corridor. The center part of the corridor was very, very clear, but the periphery was not quite so clear. And <clears throat> I didn't realize at the time, but it was because it felt a little disorienting. And my soul family, they just supported me. They booed me up with love. And, and we continued down this, down this future. Um, and I realized, I've come to realize late now that, that, um, that the periphery is the potential that we have, that we can go a little to the right if we need to, but we're always going to come back to center. We go a little left if we need to, we'll always come back to center. But we have these additional potentials that are available to us to be able to, you know, and be able, that's, I think that's where our free will comes in. So I'm going through and I'm seeing all these events that I don't have any reference to. And I, yeah, I didn't know what to do with it, but I just kind of went with what my soul family were kind of directing me. And I finally get to this one point where the light, all these millions upon millions of fragments of light in unison kind of spoke. It was this resonant voice. And I took this voice to be God, to tell you the truth. And it said, this is not your time. You must return. Well, I said, no way, <laughs> no way. I'm not going back. I know my body is in that ocean. It's broken. Um, I know that um, 
I have met a family that loves me. I've never felt love like this. And there's no way you, you can't, I, I'm not going back to that life. I'm, I'm, I'm staying here. And, um, and I thought I put up a pretty good argument, but uh, I guess uh, <laughs> but the, the light spoke one more time. It said, you must return. You have a purpose. And that word purpose just resonated through my being. And <clears throat> it's an interesting thing when we're in the light, we have this expanded consciousness that is so much more than what we have available to us here. It's like we're connected to every soul that ever was and every soul that ever will be. So we have this, this huge collective consciousness that we're a part of and we have access to. And so when I heard that word purpose, and it was just resonating through me, I, it, was, it was so simple and so efficient and I knew it, and I just, I immediately came to acceptance that, yeah, I've, you know, I've got this purpose. And with that acceptance, I found myself outside my body. My body's still in the ocean being tumbled and tossed in this wave, in this uh, breaker zone. And I'm watching. And the three original beings that greeted me of my soul family were with me. They were slightly behind me and we were uh, just watching. And I was kind of like, how is the enormity of me going to fit in there? And, it, you know, it just like it, <laughs> I, so I was just kind of in awe and just just pondering. I know. And, and I saw this because the body was dead. I mean, it had drowned. It was being tumbled and tossed. This lifeless form was just being buffeted by the sea. And, and so I saw the bow line of the zodiac actually come up and start beating up against my lifeless chest. And the bitter end was just beating my chest. And I was just watching that. And then all of a sudden, another uh, set must have hit the wreckage of the zodiac, and there must have been a little bit of air left in one of the one of the pontoon parts of the zodiac. That it popped it up, and when it did, it wrapped itself around my arm, and pulled my arm up, dislocating my shoulder and my arm, and pulled my body up to the surface. But I'm not in my body, so I didn't. I didn't feel any pain. I didn't feel anything like that. But I just, I rose up watching as my body then gets tangled up in this wreckage. And another set of waves come and it starts beating my body up against the wreckage. And it pushed some of that salt water out of my lungs. And that's when my soul family gave me a gentle push. And uh, I found myself just vibrating back into my body. I like to say that, you know, dying is hard, but coming back to life is even more difficult because it, it wasn't pleasant. And I won't get into the graphic details of, of what it's like to expel salt water. Um, but um, basically, your, your throat is so raw at that point that. Um, that you know, all I could do is squeak and squawk, but I could hear my the other guys that were in the in that zodiac with me. They now they're the heroes of this story because they stayed on station looking for me. They gathered together, but this is what we were trained to do, you know, to you know look for each other and then we all will go in together. And so they were there looking for me. And somehow one of them had hung on to a flashlight. And my wife, she likes to say, yeah, you went to one light, they went to the other. But, um, but it's just, I, they're, they're looking for me and I, I can only like, I say squeak and squawk a little bit, to, you know, and they finally find me and they come over and I'm still kind of tangled up in the wreckage. And, uh, and so decision now, we're all together, we're gonna swim in. We still got a mile to swim. I have a dislocated shoulder and a thumb. And so I'm just hanging on with one hand, but I keep finding myself going 
going under. I keep I'm going down. I can't stay on the surface. And I never have this trouble. Um, you know, I'm like I said, thousands of hours in the ocean. I'm, you know, uh, and so I kicked off. I had steel toed boots on that night and brand new Red Wings cost a lot of money. <laughs> kicked them off and phew, down to the bottom they went. And I'm still having trouble staying up on the surface. But it's kind of a funny thing, you know, when, when you come back from one of these experiences, you feel like you're half here and half there. And so you're still connected to that greater expanded consciousness. And I knew, I just knew that there was something wrong with my way May West. I knew there was something wrong with my life vest. And so I popped it open, which is something you really don't want to do in, in 25, 30 foot seas, but I popped it open and the lining of this old uh, May West, the fiber filling was, was dry rotted and had become super saturated with salt water. And what was actually supposed to bring me up to the surface was actually dragging me down. And so I ejected my life vest. They, these type of vests have since been banned by the Coast Guard. But uh, I let, I just, I, I, you know, I, I let it go. It never to be seen again. And, um, and I hung on and we all swam that mile in the shore. And when we got in the shore, we all are trained in first aid and, and, uh, um, my pelt, my mates, uh, popped my shoulder back in and I popped my thumb in and, and we, we walked back to the Harbor. So it was a rough night. And, uh, and I, I have to admit, because I was extremely hypothermic because I had died in the ocean and my body temperature and all my heat had gone while I was dead. And, um, and uh, I basically, we all, we drove each other home and we went and radioed the ship and told them that we wouldn't be coming back. You know, we didn't, we didn't want to advertise because there's a lot of people that beach home and we and these guys had lost all their gear all their duffel bags and everything and they were hoping that some of it would wash in so we didn't want to advertise on because back in those days we had ship to shore radio we didn't have cell phones to talk to the crew directly so you know i we're on a we're on an open line basically you know you're going to a marine operator and you're talking to you know everybody in the world is listening on in this so so we didn't want to advertise that you know we got all our gear is going to be washing ashore sometime tonight so we just told them we won't be coming back, <clears throat> and uh, and we went home. And <clears throat> when I got home, my wife, I didn't know it at the time, but she had had a nightmare. She had had a dream that I had died, and so she was awake. And I walked up. We lived in one of those um, one of those condominiums where all the they all faced a central uh, courtyard. Um, and, and so I'm outside my door and I'm, I'm stripping because my, my pockets are full of sand, like a sandbag. My eyes are, and ears are encrusted with sand, my pockets, everything. And I'd lost my shirt and, and I didn't have, you know, shoes and socks. And the only thing I had on was my pants. And, um, and so I was taking those off just, and, and I'm outside my door and she hears, you know, the noise outside the door. And suddenly she's like, what the? are you doing? And she opens the door, pulls me in. And the minute she touches me, she realizes I am ice cold. I'm like the walking dead. And so she hurries me into the bathroom, puts me in the tub and starts pouring cold water into the tub to try to slowly bring my body temperature up. And um, I'm a very intelligent woman, you know, and I thought she was trying to scald me to death because if, I mean, this cold water actually felt like scalding hot to me. And, um, and so she's like calming me down, calming me down. And um, I, I, I barely hanging on at this point. I, I'm so drained. I had like no energy left. I'm so drained. But I had the wherewithal to tell her, you know, hon, I think tonight, I think I died. Now, I didn't know that she'd had this dream. I didn't know about that. And that 
it had scared the you know what out of her and so uh, she uh i'm sorry i i used to be a sailor so i used to swear like a trucker you know like a sailor I used to swear like a sailor but so now i'm trying to calm my my vocabulary down a little when i tell my story but so anyway she was scared and when i told her that i had died she freaked out <clears throat> and she thought that I was in some kind of form of shock or something. And so she, we had a very negative response, let's just say. And so I thought, oh my gosh, I can't talk to her. I can't talk to her about this. And, um, and the next day I get up and, and some of the guys that were in the Zodiac with me, they call and we're going to meet up and we're going to go down to the shore and look for deer. And I felt like, a truck had run over. I mean, my chest, I felt like somebody had driven over my chest. But they picked me up and we went down to the ocean. And the sea was still just roiling, huge waves still coming in. And this night, it, it had actually eroded about 13 feet of the, there was a 13 foot cliff in the sand from the storm. And we're standing on the edge of this, you know, sand cliff looking out over the sea to see if there's you know anybody's gear has washed up or anything and i'm looking out over the ocean and again i still feel like i'm like half here half there you know and i swear i could feel the earth breathing just looking out over the ocean it was the most amazing i felt more connected to this earth at that moment than I ever had or have since. But because of that connection and walking with that expanded awareness from the light, just, you know. But one of the things that really freaked me out was when, when I came back, I could see, well, we call them auras now. I mean, I didn't know what they were. I call them life force energies. But have you ever seen a palm tree's aura? It's like absolutely amazing. And if you, and then, you know, we lived in, in you know, in Southern California and in, in Santa Barbara is a beautiful town. Everything is landscaped and it just, everything was alive. It was, it was just amazing. And I'd never seen, I was an engineer. I saw things in black and white. I'd never seen anything like this. It was actually freaking me out a little bit because it was like, what the heck? You know, I really got hit in the head or something during this, you know, during this death and coming back to life and everything and talking to God and all of that. It was just, it was freaking me out, but I didn't feel like I could share it because I couldn't share it with my wife because she did, she had, you know, when I tried to share with her, it didn't work out too well. And so then, but the thing, um, in a, in an environment where you are a research vessel back in the early 80s, and we did underwater exploration, it was incredibly dangerous work. And so we put our lives on the line all the time, in each other's hands all the time. So death was a taboo subject. We didn't talk about death. It just wasn't something that we would, you know, that we would, where we would, we wouldn't go down there. So I didn't feel like I could share this with anybody. But I was having these experiences. And another thing that really freaked me out was when I looked into someone's eyes, because that's I, I was always a very intense guy. So I would always, you know, when I communicated with you, I would be looking you right in the eyes. And um, because I was kind of intense. But um I would look in their eyes and I could see their light. I could see their fragment of light. And it felt incredibly invasive to me. It felt like uh, I don't, you know, unless you've given me permission, I really shouldn't see your light. You know, I, I mean, that's something that is yours. It's personal. And so I, it was like, I couldn't look at people in the eyes because all, all I would see is their light. And so I was freaked out and I just wanted my old life back. I was like, I don't know what this stuff is. Cause you know, as an engineer, this is, all foreign to me. I don't even have a, a name or a vocabulary for any of this kind of thing. And I just wanted my old life back. So after about three or four days, the the connection finally dissipated, disappeared so that, but I still saw auras, I still saw people's light. 
and I was and I was starting to get these um, I, I used to call it downloads this information that it wasn't anything that I had learned in school wasn't anything that I'd lived in life so but suddenly I knew things I had these knowings and and um, and all this was just really overwhelming me and um, and so I wanted my old life back so I, I and the whole thing about talking to God and arguing with God and, and all of that, just, you know, I, I'm not the type of person that's supposed to have that type of experience. So I just tried to box it up. I like to say, I put it in a box, wrapped it up with duct tape because divers really like duct tape. I wrote with a magic marker on it, do not touch and shoved it as far back in my mind as possible and said, I'm not going to go there. But experience doesn't let you do that. So I continued to see people's light. I continued to see auras for quite a while until I learned how to kind of turn it on and off. But the knowings, that was the most disturbing for me because as an engineer and going to school and all that, I was a very rational kind of guy. Suddenly to have these knowings and to know things and some things were were things that were going to happen. Some things were, you know, it was it was very you know, I didn't know what to do with it because this is all new. So what does a good engineer do? I would test it. Is this information that I'm getting accurate, reliable, no matter where it's coming from, I don't know, but is it accurate and reliable? Is it verifiable? And gosh, you know, <laughs> it was. <laughs> and so I kept testing it and testing it, and this went on for years, and, and I kept it to myself. And, you know, some of the guys that were in that boat said, you know, Dave, we were looking for you for a good, we figure 15 to 18 minutes, and we know you can't hold your breath that long. What the heck happened? And so I, I would, you know, kind of, I got really good at hiding, and I told him, well, Neptune spit me back. Or I would, you know, I would just make light of it because that's something that young men do. When you, when we would go into a situation where it was a really close call, we would get this false bravado, you know, and we would kind of like laugh it all off and everything and just move on and then leave it alone. And that's kind of what happened with my, my shipmates and me and this experience that night. So I just lived with with this experience, but there was an interesting thing that the near death experience and the life review, especially in the soul family that gave me this gift that I could wrap my, my mind around. And that was acceptance of who I was because you can't go through that life review without really seeing who you are. So I could accept that this is who I am. And yeah, I've got a lot of work to do because <laughs> I was not the, the best human walking this earth and tolerance tolerance for other people and the situations that we find ourselves in. So acceptance of myself, tolerance of where I am in life, and then truth. And the truth was a little different in that it wasn't the factual truth, the black and white truth that I grew up with as an engineer, but it was more of a personal truth that my heart recognized. And so I kind of grabbed that acceptance, tolerance, and truth. And that was kind of my mantra. And I used that, I grabbed onto that, and that was my anchor. That was my stabilizing force that I could move forward with. So I lived with that for like 11 years. And then um, I quit my life at sea because like many experiencers, I started getting these urges to be more of service and being three, 500 miles offshore. I didn't feel like I could, I was doing everything I could be to be of service to humanity. It's just this urge that you have. And so I quit my life at sea, started working in, uh, in, in hospitals, uh, specifically dialysis programs. And I became the, uh, the manager of dialysis programs in central New York for um, St. Joseph's Hospital at the time. And, um, and I took a vacation. I went, my wife and I, we went to, uh, with this spiritual group out of Geneseo that um, was, Tom Sawyer 
who was a very well-known near-death experiencer, was part of this group. And so we went to Sedona. And while I was there, I grew up, part of my growing up when I was being bounced around here and there as a youth, but my teenage years was spent just outside Sedona. And uh, so I knew the area really well. And I thought, well, I'm going to go with the spiritual group and I'm going to go tromp some of the old trails of my youth. And I'm just going to, I'm going to relax and have a good time. We got there and the very first day I'm, we're, we're supposed to meditate at Bell Rock. And I, I knew this night, neat little grotto and I went up there and, and was looking out over the valley. And, um, I'm, and, I, and when I lived there as a kid, the, uh, I told you I had a dysfunctional childhood. Well, I spent more of my time with my friends and my friends were mostly Native American kids and their grandmothers kind of taught me how, how to find my sacred space. And so that was how I knew how to meditate. So I was going into my sacred space when I heard the voice, the light speak to me and it told me return to the light. And when I did, I found myself back in that void. I went through the void. I went, met my soul family again. I, we went through the life review again. Only this time, 11 years had passed. And I got to see in the life review how much I had changed in those 11 years from the first near-death experience. And so this is kind of a near-death-like experience where I'm, I'm not really, you know, I'm not, my life wasn't threatened in any way, shape, or form. I was just in a meditative state, which the light kind of interceded in. And so I got to see just by adopting acceptance, tolerance, and truth and, and, and realizing this, this ability to have these downloads and this information come, that it had changed drastically changed the way I was living my life and who I was and how I was interacting with people. And the second experience really showed me, and I wasn't quite as in gaga awe this time because what, it's the second time around, right? So I was more, I examined more, I was looking at more closely. And I saw that interconnection, that, that those golden threads that we have connecting us all together and what a tapestry that it actually creates. And so I was really, really examining this experience a lot deeper. But um, when, I, when I came back, I was, you would have thought I had drowned because I was just drenched in perspiration and just sitting there and I felt so weak like I was like on wobbly knees and I'm walking down and the rest of the group had already meditated and come back and gathered. And I'm coming down there. And one of Tom Sawyer's best friends, Richard, was um, was there fiddling around with a guitar. And um, and I came up to him and I said, and I started just blah, you know, just I had this experience, you know, and he looks at me just calm as could be, you know, no, you know, just just looking at me and and accepting what I was saying. And then he said, oh, you had a near-death experience. Like, la-di-da, no big deal. You know, and I, <laughs> and I was like, holy cow. You know, it's the first time I'd heard of, I, because of meeting Tom Sawyer, I'd heard about near-death experiences. And so I kind of assumed that this, this is what it was. But this is the first person I'm telling my experience to that just accepted it, just totally accepted it. And it was the best gift anybody in the world could have ever given me. So the second experience taught me I really have to now live with what I'd learned from these two experiences and from all the integration that I had done during the 11 years of isolation. But now I didn't feel like I, you know, because uh, another thing that happened at this point was suddenly spirit wasn't just downloads, now spirit was speaking to me. And it wasn't just one voice that was speaking to me. It was like the 12 voices of my soul family. They each had different strengths and different concerns, and they would all talk to me as needed, kind of like. And so I started hearing, 
so again, you know, you go through a little shock period, like, boy, if I tell everybody that, you know, I hear voices and they're telling me what to do, you know, I mean, you don't say that in public, right? Especially this is, you know, 94 when this happened. And, and, and so, so I, I just, I would, I started sharing my experience though with trusted people because I was still, you know, I'd hidden for 11 years. And so it was really hard for me to share this very personal experience, but but spirit kept urging me to, you know, share my experience. So I started with the, you know, because it, I, these urges were just so strong. I started what I called my quiet ministry, where I was just going to live by what I'd learned in this experience. And I was going to, you know, put that out in every aspect of my life, not just, you know, going to church on Sunday. It was going to be every part of my life at work, at play um, all the time. So I figured that was my new commitment and that. Um, and then I, I, I made this, um, I made this agreement with spirit. Spirit and I like to go back and forth, you know, we like, you know, uh, in those early days when the communication was, we were, it was young and we were trying to establish, you know, this communication. Um, I used to, I used to argue a lot with spirit, like, I'm not going to do that. Are you kidding me? You know, and um <laughs> And spirit would gently, lovingly kind of guide me where I needed to be to where as it was like, I was going to do it no matter what. But anyway, uh, but they did it gently. And and so spirit was urging me to really, you know, put this out. So I, I built a website. I put, built a website where I shared my near-death experience. I thought, there, I don't have, to, I could be this anonymous person person behind this website, you know, and I could share my experience. And I went on to Endurf and I went on to these other websites, you know, near death experience websites. And um and I and I shared my experience there. But but there's you can uh, you can have a bit of anonymity, you know, being behind these websites. So that wasn't good enough. Spirit was still urging, you know. And so I I'm living my quiet ministry. And I'm I'm trying to you know just just get on with life, and um and and live by what I'd learned. And it was and and life actually started to smooth out quite a bit for me at that point because now I'm I'm kind of living in the flow where spirit wanted me to go, I would go instead of you know going where my ego wanted me to go or where this wanted me to go. And it was amazing how how much living a quiet ministry and accepting more. Um, and, and listening to guidance, um, how it allowed me to, to, to move forward. Well, in um, I had become the manager of dialysis programs at St. Joe's Hospital. I think I mentioned that. And I'm in my office one day when all of a sudden it felt like my back exploded. I'd been having a lot of pains back pain and, and numbness in my arm. And I was, I always attributed it to, because in those days we were starting to keyboard a lot more, you know, and stuff like that. And I thought I was getting carpal tunnel or something like that. And, um, <clears throat> and suddenly I'm in my office and, you know, and I, I'm the assistant director at this point. And, and suddenly my back explodes. And so I go into the director's office and, I, and I'm supposed to be having a meeting with her and, and one of the vice presidents. And I said, I, I'm really in a lot of pain. I'm, I'm going to go up to the ED, the emergency department, and uh, present myself. And so I walked a block and a half from our dialysis center to up to the hospital uh, emergency department. And when I got there and I at triage, I, I kind of gave my, you know, what's happening. They, they thought, oh my God, you're going to a, a cardiac arrest. Come on, let's put you on a 12 lead. And, and I'm like, no, I don't think that's it. But, but, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I'm tolerant. I'll let you, uh, <laughs> this is what you, this is what you feel. I'm going to let you do it, but I'm in a lot of pain. I just really want some pain medication. And for you to check out my back, there's just something wrong with my back. And, um, but they they had to rule out that it was a cardiac arrest, and so we went. And meanwhile, I'm just and they can't give you any medication while they're doing that. So, so I'm just uh, just you know going through all this, and um, then they finally 
uh, take me to have some some chest x-rays. And um, oh God, that was pure torture because they were making me twist this way and that way. And um, and then they finally put me in a room and um, I had, my wife and I, my first wife and I had separated by this point in my life because we had just grown in separate directions. And, um, and, I, and I called up my, my present wife um, who was my girlfriend at the time. And I said, yeah, I'm in the hospital and, you know, and in the emergency department. And so she comes rushing in and she's mad because I'd been, a, been in the emergency department for half a day, you know, and she's like, why did you call me sooner? But I'm just sitting there and all of a sudden I'm in a room and the door opens and the nurse that's taking care of me was my secretary while she was going through nursing school. And she comes in and she's like in tears. And suddenly I'm having a, I'm remembering a moment in my life review where I was previewing part of my life. This was one of those moments. And, and so she comes in and she's crying and it's like, I know exactly, you know, and I know exactly what's going to happen next. And the, and a resident comes in and they're going to tell me that um, I have cancer and that, you know, I, I knew exactly what they were gonna do and what they were gonna say. Well, they didn't actually use the C word, they didn't use cancer, but they, so he comes in, the resident comes in and he's kind of hemming and hawing and, and, you know, and I'm, and I'm like, and I know I'm gonna regret this in my next life review, but I let him suffer through that because I was just, I was just observing this. And so he finally, comes out and he says yeah you know we found you know you have some you you have some lesions in your in your lungs that have metastasized into your spine they ate into your spine and your you know ate away two and a half bones of your thoracic and your spine is collapsed and we want to keep you for more tests so they kept me in the hospital for quite a while doing all kinds of tests. And they found I had lesions in my hip, my brain, my kidneys. The cancer was very, very um, moving very rapidly. And, um, <clears throat> and because I was an assistant director of one of the programs there, I was able to put together a healthcare team of my choosing. Um, and, um, and, and so I, would, I went with kind of like the doctor's doctor, who's, who's the, you know, like my, my medical director, I talked to him, I said, hey, you know, who would you go to if you had, you know? So I went to, you know, I went to some of the leading people in, in our area. And, um, <clears throat> and one of them said, uh, Dave, you know, I wanna be honest with you, you probably have about eight weeks. You really should get your affairs in order and we'll make you as comfortable as possible. And, um, and, you know, because it's game over. <laughs> and so I had seen in my life review that I was going to have cancer, but I had also seen I was going to live beyond it. So I immediately fired that doctor. And I kept a couple other doctors that were willing to work with me. And so using guidance from spirit and use, because I've had all these years now, to because this is 2000 when this happened December of 2000 and um and so I've had all these years to you know work with my guidance and and all of that and I started following what what you know spirit had directed me this almost ended up like a like a third I almost had like a third life review during this because while I was in the hospital I was uh, in my bed, pretty immobile with a collapsed spine. You're, you're really not moving much. And uh, they, they're pumping me full of morphine and Percocet. And now as, a, as, a, as one of the hospital management, you know, people know you on every shift and a hospital is open 24 seven, you know. And so uh, people started coming into my room all hours of the day and night. And they would sit on my bed and they'd start to tell me, you know, Dave, you said this to me, or you did this one time. 
and it really affected me. And so that quiet ministry that I was living by had really affected all these people. I had no idea. And it was incredibly humbling, but they were coming there and they were sitting on my bed because they all thought that I just had weeks to live and that this was their only opportunity to say goodbye. And, but meanwhile, I'm patting them on the back saying, oh, no, no, I'm not going anywhere because I knew I was going to survive this. But if you know Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and the stages of, of death and dying, you know, the first one is denial and you finally work your way up to acceptance. Well, they all felt I was in denial, but I really was in acceptance of the whole situation. <laughs> but, but, but anyway, the nurses, so many people were coming into my room all hours of the day and night from all the different uh, departments and shifts and stuff like that. Cause I was also one of the safety officers for the hospital and stuff like that. And, um, and so, uh, they moved my room right next to the nurse's station where they keep an eye on because they 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 had you know you need to get some rest and we we're not gonna we're gonna limit when people can come see you so i i said okay you know what could i do i have no control you lose control when you're a patient in the hospital so you have to give away all that control so um <clears throat> one afternoon one of the nuns comes in, this is a Catholic hospital, one of the nuns comes in and I've, I've got a really good relationship with the nun that's part of our department. So I figured this must be the oncology nun. And so she comes in, sits down and I start talking to her. And as I'm talking to her, spirit starts giving me this way to manage the pain. Because one of my dilemmas during this was they were giving me so much morphine and Percocet that I couldn't hear spirit. But when this nun came in, suddenly I could hear spirit and spirit started giving me. And so we're talking and we're talking about how I can use this, this meditation and, and how I can connect with, um, you know, with, with my guidance and do a bunch of, of healing type of, of, uh, meditations and techniques and things like that. And I was like, what a blessing to have her come in and, and have somebody to talk to about all this, you know? So after she left, and the next time one of the nurses came in, I said, oh, you know, I didn't catch the name of the nun that came in, your, your oncology nun. I said, could, you know, could you tell me who she was? Because I, I, I know most of the nuns that work here at the hospital, but I, I've never met her before. And they, they, she looked at me like I'd just grown a second head. And she goes, Dave, nobody has been in here to visit you all afternoon. And so I was like, all right, all right. Uh, you know, so you sent an angel to talk to me. And uh, that's, I mean, that's the only thing I could. And they thought I was really, they were like, are you okay? You know, uh, do we need to do a little intervention here? Um, <laughs> but anyway, and I'm sure it went down in my medical jacket at the time, but I really, at that point, I, I didn't care anymore. Um, so it was like these three events really, really helped me to kind of let go. Um, I used what I'd learned and, and the guidance that I got to put together, again, the healthcare team and, and spirit was very clear with me. And this, I don't advise this for everybody who's going through stage four cancer. This worked for me. It may not work for everyone, but I used traditional and holistic approaches. And I, I used my guidance to, to weigh what's going to work for me. And, and, and I had a lot of friends in the holistic community, as well as a lot of friends in the you know, traditional medicine. And, um, and everybody was throwing stuff at me. But I, so I used my guidance to weigh out, okay, how am I going to deal with this? And so once I got my plan and we were acting on it, um, within six months, guidance was telling me, things are better. Things are better. And so I asked my doctor, I asked my oncologist, could you, could we do another, um, could we do another PET scan? 
because you know the PET scan tells if there's any active cells in your body, and cancer cells are active cells, and they can clearly see. And and he was and he was like, oh, you know, we don't want to put you through that. And, but I said, no, no, I really, really, I, you know, I knew I had my patient rights. I really wanted to do this, and so he agreed, and they scheduled the test. But then everybody and I got God bless them. They, they didn't want to deliver bad news. So nobody read the results because they didn't feel there's any way in heck that I was going to be any better because it was just so severe and so advanced and moving so rapidly through my body. So I finally, one of the nurses um, in the oncology ward was the, uh, was the brother to one of the nurses that worked for me. So I said, hey, would you read the report? I know you can't show it to me, but would you read the report and then, you know, let me know, let my doctor know, whatever. And he read the report and he came in, he said, you know, Dave, there's actually good news in that report. I'm going to make sure your doctor reads it. And so when the doctor finally came to me, he said, and this was, I mean, months had gone by since the test. It, it was taken, it took forever to get these results to get somebody to read it. And so he finally, he goes, wow. He goes, I, I, he says, the results are just astounding that it shows, you know, that there are no active cancer cells in your body from head to toe. And, and so we need to do more tests. And I'm, <laughs> I'm like, okay, we'll do another test, but then that's it. I'm not gonna do any more chemo, no more radiation. I said, I'm just going to work with my holistic, and, and that's the end of it. We're done. I, I'm done with this. And the second test showed I'm absolutely clear. So this is six months into stage four lung and bone cancer, which I was, was not supposed to be survivable, but we were able to overcome it. But what it really did for me was it allowed me the freedom now to live the life that spirit really wanted me to do, because I you know, I'm still living with a collapsed spine. I was then anyway. It took another year. Uh, I had to survive for another year before they would agree to do any uh, corrective surgeries. And I went through three corrective surgeries in, a, in two months. Um, and then I was, I was still in a wheelchair. I was trussed up, you know, from chin to, to my waist, you know, and, and um, I had to learn how to walk again. All of that it was a very long recovery with a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. But it was, it was an amazing period for me because I learned a lot about gratitude. I knew I was going through incredible suffering. I mean, how could you not? But I was, so I was going through this suffering, but you know what? I was grateful for the opportunity because I knew there was growth there. And I knew that once I got beyond it, what I had learned in those periods of suffering, I could help others with. So I develop part of a new part of my practice. It's, you know, I do these uh, contemplations and that's what my, my second book, my first book is about my near-death experience and dealing with cancer. My second book is about how using contemplative meditation allows you to commune with your higher consciousness and, and, and grow spiritually. So I started this practice of contemplation and the way I would always kick it off was I would go into gratitude. I'd be grateful for everything in my life, the good, the bad, the ugly, because when you're in a state of pure gratitude, we detach from the ego because gratitude is pure in its own self. And so that state of gratitude is an amazing tool that we all have available to us to be able to reach that meditative state besides you know the breath exercises and and going into stillness and all of that if you add a gratitude practice it can it can really help if you're having trouble with your practice it's something that i would i would highly recommend and um and so by doing that i was able to really get back you know forge ahead and now i have uh, you know i i do practice uh, I, what I learned, the energetic healing work that I learned, and I, I do, I have a practice that I call it white light energy healing. If you go on my website, you can, you know, you can see how that works. 
and um, <clears throat> and I and I uh, you know I, I I volunteer for a lot of organizations and I do a lot of work that way and everything. But I feel like I can recognize now when I'm having one of those interactions, when I'm having an interaction, when I when I'm having a synchronicity, and how it's steering me, how it's guiding me and how it's helping me. And life smooths out when you start living this way, when you let go and you let God have his way. It's amazing how suddenly things come as you need them and, and this and that and the other thing. Because it was frightening for me because I remember I was an engineer. I used to hold on tight. I used to plan everything, you know. I had spreadsheets of everything, you know. Um, so... <laughs> So I, had, I, I learned how to live life over again because of these experiences. So yeah, dying taught me how to live. Dying saved my life. It helped me to move forward. And the biggest thing that I recognized was, you know, a lot of times we feel like we're these separate individuals forging our way through life, but really we're all interconnected. And that all we have to do is take a breath and listen and Spirit's there to guide us. Thank you. Wow. Diane, you're muted. I can't hear you. I clicked it. It didn't click. There we go. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Wow. Um, you want to do uh, some questions? Do, yep. do yeah, anything? let's. Uh, Why don't you put them on the chat? Okay. Let me Everybody. let me open up the chat. I see there's one there already. Oh, the web page. Okay, sure. Um, <clears throat> my my website is dharmatalks.com. D H A R M A T A L K S dot com. Dharma talks, and that's kind of the portal to just about everything that I do. You know, if you want to see me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, <laughs> uh, TikTok, you know, that's kind of my kind of my portal to everything. The books, actually, I, I um, and I see the next question is, what are the name of your books? Um, my first book is Voyage of Purpose, and it's co-written by my wife uh, Cindy. Griffith Bennett and myself. My wife uh, teaches here at ARE, and um, and she helped me write it because I'm a I'm a engineer. I'm a terrible writer, but um, so she helped me with the first edits. But then um, we actually hired a, a professional editor, and these were all uh, were all published by Findhorn Press. And then my second book is um, is called A Voice as Old as Time. And it's about contemplations for spiritual growth and development. So those are the two books that I've written. And um, <clears throat> so let me go down the chat here. The books are also in the blurb about Dave and the email that I sent. So if, in case you want to refer to them quickly. Yeah, I hope I hope you have an affiliation with Amazon or something so that you can get a get a. Uh, a little piece of the pie there if somebody if they order it through your blurb um, uh, unfortunately no? No. oh well um the um the the second one a voice as old as time i they it's out of print and if you have trouble finding a used copy or something like that i have cases of them in my garage so would love to get i'd love to get one I, okay. I had been trying to get a hold of a copy of it and, and couldn't. Yeah, yeah, they're not. Um, it, it went out of print when uh, Findhorn Press was uh, was was bought out by um, by Bear Company, and so it's it's part of a bigger publishing house now. But um, but they decided not to re republish that second book. That my voice is old as time. You can get on Amazon and any you know through any any local uh, way of getting it. So, um, I'm I'm trying to read the chat here. Do Sarah think, asks, "How do you use gratitude in your everyday life now?" Yeah, gratitude is huge. Um, 
like I said, I use it to start my day before my feet even hit the ground. Once I wake, I start my gratitudes. And I'm, and I'm, and the funny thing is, is when I do my gratitudes, I don't, and not so much about me. It's about everything around me, my friends, my family, my community. Um, I, I give a lot of gratitudes to that. I don't really focus on myself so much, but in the course of my day, a lot of times, you know, we all face trials and challenges in, in life. You know, it's just part of living life. And, and one of the things that I've learned through this journey is that uh, to be thankful, be thankful for all of it. And, and, it, and when you do that, it's like taking an extra breath. It allows you to step back a little bit so that your awareness is not so much caught up in the circumstances, but you can actually rise above the circumstances with a clarity of vision that um, sometimes the circumstances pulls us away from. You know, we all have a higher, you know, that clarity, but a lot of times, you know, it's hard to reach. And so sometimes we have to work toward a practice in order to find our doorway to that higher level. But gratitude is, is one of my tools that I use. When I give thanks, it, it helps me to step back from the circumstances for a minute and look at it from a higher perspective with a higher sense of awareness. So I, I, that's kind of how I use it in a day to, day to day. And I see there's a question in the chat that asks about uh, conventional and holistic treatments. Um, Yes, there's, um, I, I attribute my healing um, mostly to the combination. Um, I really feel that for, my, for myself, I needed both. I don't believe that's the case for everybody because I have, uh, because I've been dealing with, with people that have had terminal illness and, 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 and through my healing practice, I've seen that there are many people that use no traditional and I've seen many people that use no holistic. And, but they've been able to get past, past it. One of the things I try to teach though, is not to think of it as a fight. It was interesting. One of my best friends mailed me a box uh, of professional boxing gloves when, when he saw that I had stage four lung and bone cancer and, you know, and, and was trying to tell me, you know, you're in it for the fight of your life, you know, type of thing. And it's like, I just put them aside. I thanked him very much because I appreciated his sentiment, you know, that he was there to support me in that way. But I don't like to think about it as a fight so much as an obstacle that I need to overcome. So I look at all of my life's challenges that way. They're just, they're just obstacles that I need to overcome. Because remember, I've got that, uh, that mantra, you know, acceptance and tolerance, you know, of, of where I am and what I'm doing in life. So, so an obstacle is just something that now I'll find a way to either go over or around or through the obstacle, depending upon what is appropriate, you know, but, um, but I, my healing, it worked for me, holistic approaches. And, and on my website, I, there's a, a section there about that talks about my cancer and, and some of the things that and some of the holistic approaches that I used because I you know I used yes SEAC tea to this day I still drink SEAC tea um, and so, which is a Native American um, uh, JFK um, took SEAC tea during his cancer and stuff like that so that was one of the ones that that spirit told me to really go with Oh, that's a good question. The, uh, Jane, Jane asks, how has your faith or religious beliefs changed since your experience? Quite a bit because, <clears throat> because I grew up and I was uh, thrown from one family to the next to the next, I really didn't have a, a belief. I, I wasn't, it wasn't that I didn't have a belief. I just didn't see where it was working for anybody. So, but when I was growing up and those Native American grandmothers that taught me how to find my sacred space, they seemed like they had a key there. Because when I, when I did my first vision quest, that was huge, but I was 14, you know, and you have to get on with your life. So, and so I kind of put that aside, but after my near-death experience, I said, you know, what those grandmothers were trying to teach me really rings true with what I experienced in my near-death experience. So I felt that was 
that was a path. And so I started looking at that. And then I started, if you look in my library, I have just about every religion and belief and philosophy represented in my library because I, I became a voracious reader looking for the spirituality in all types of belief systems and the looking for love. You know, I wanted, I wanted these spiritual, I wanted to see what they had to say about this love. And um, and so I became a student of of that on my in my spare time, and <clears throat> still am. But what really gravitates to me is um, my spirituality. I still follow a lot of my Native American spirituality, but I also have found that Buddhism is very similar. There's a lot of parallels there between Buddhism and and um, and Native Americans. So I've kind of put together my own conglomeration of, of beliefs and, and what works for me, what resonates with my heart, my truth. Remember, we were talking about our own personal truth. And so that's where, yeah, that's where I, I find my, uh, my stuff. So I learned on the other side that there, there was no one way to do anything. There's as many ways to do anything as there are souls in the universe. Yeah, what's the old saying? There's many paths up the mountain, right? Right. You know, so, and what works for me, you know, <clears throat> doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for everybody. And I, I try to be very clear about that. One of my early near-death experience mentors, um, Margaret Keene, most people aren't aware of her. She wasn't real big with the IANS community, but she was really close friends with Tom Sawyer and some of that group. And um, she taught me to don't, don't look at this experience as the end all for everything. Don't live your life and live the best life you possibly can. And don't ever, ever, ever allow anybody put you up on a pedestal be real, be human, be yourself, be authentic. And so that was one of the, as a mentor to a, uh, a near-death experiencer that was trying to, you know, integrate the experience, that was huge for me. That, and that has stuck with me. Um, let's see. Um, oncology. Bobby, retired oncology nurse, have been interested in contemplative practice for a long time now. If you go to my website, you can contact me directly and, and, and you know, I can give you a, a PayPal link to be able to get me a, get, get you a copy of uh, The Voice as Old as Time as far as the contemplative living book. Wonderful. Yes, John Barnes' uh, method of uh, myofascial release at, at uh, Therapy on Rocks, um, I'm aware of it. And, um, and I think any release therapies, I, there's a, a few out there, um, are just amazing. Because remember when I, I said, in fact, most experiencers, they'll tell you on the way out of this life, there has to be a release. There has to be a letting go. And it's a powerful, powerful tool, powerful tool. I'm trying to read the chat, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, how do I view astrology or, or other esoteric pra practices and philosophies as tools to help us? My wife is a psychic and she works for ARE and astrology is one of her go-tos and i know very little about astrology i'm very ignorant when it comes to that i, ba I barely know my moon or sun sign um <laughs> but but um she follows my chart quite a bit and i am astounded at how and i'm also very close friends with ellen die has, has ellen die talked to chicago Ions? who ellen die no, she has not. 
Oh, I would highly recommend her as a speaker at some point. And, and she has done some astrology that just blows my mind because she, she looks at, you know, what's happening here in our country, in the world right now. And, and she has forecasted, and because I've been, you know, she's, I've been following her forecast for a few years now, and she has forecasted everything that's happening um, just by looking at astrology. So I, yeah, I, I, I support, you know, a good astrologer, you know, somebody who really delves into it. One of my best friends back in yes. central New York was, uh, was a intense astrologer. And if you sat down with him, you were going to get two hours of astrology. It was like, <laughs> it was intense, but, uh, Dennis Cole, he, he was an amazing astrologer. He's still practicing in central New York. All right. I don't, is there, did I miss a question? Might have to. Uh, Let's see. Um, might have to raise hands if somebody wants to ask something. Maybe. Oh, there's a new one. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. You missed the question. Someone said, has anything been revealed to you concerning ET visitation or the reasons for studying ET visitations. Interesting. Uh, thanks, Craig. Um, that's a great question. And it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. The, um, the group I belong to here in Virginia Beach, we have um, about either once a year or once every other year, we have one of our meetings based on, um, on, on extraterrestrial contact or latest research or MUFON or, or stuff like that. And um, I used to lead a group in central New York that was, um, <clears throat> that was, uh, we had, we had monthly, well, every other month we would have big public meetings, but then every month we would have meetings just for experiencers. And it was, and I, I, I opened it up to any spiritually transformative experiences. So not just NDEs, because NDEs is just one in a huge family of, of spiritual experiences. So it was amazing at this meeting, people would come with their questions and they would, you know, and, and so there was no agenda at this meeting. It was whatever the experiencers wanted to delve into. That's what we, sometimes it was current events. Sometimes it was maybe some frustration experiencer was going through during integration, this and that and the other thing. Well, at this one meeting, two experiencers came that had alien contact experiences and it changed their lives spiritually. And so up until that point, I, I, I can honestly say I didn't see that aspect of it, but these experiencers were able to really share how their experiences changed their lives. And so I believe that there is a spiritual element there. And so I, you know, Craig, I think, you know, I, I think it's, it's something that hasn't been explored that much. Oh, there's two more messages. Let me scroll down. Oh, it's not Helen. It's Ellen, E-L-L-Y-N. Ellen Dye, D-Y-E. And uh, where is she located? She's right here in Virginia Beach as well. She's a really good friend of mine. She also helps run the, um, she's the founder of the retreat for near-death experiencers here in Virginia Beach that we have every fall. We just, we just uh, finished our retreat. It's every October we have a retreat for, um, it's called NDE R&R. &R. And, um, and we have, you know, we just, we limit it to about 24 people. And so it's very intimate and it's, it's just a, a few days at the beach. A lot of times people bring their families and, um, but Ellen, it was one of Ellen's uh, visions to have that retreat here. That's great. 
Yeah, you'll love you'll love her. She has an amazing experience where she talks to the lion people. It's like her name is completely familiar to me, and I'm not sure why. I've I've been to ARE several times, and she's, I she's I uh, she's been involved with IANS uh, over the years. Not so much ARE, um, but she's more yeah she's been more involved with IANS over the years. Yeah, there's somebody else that's with ARE there that I know really well, <laughs> that I can't remember who it is. <laughs> um, There's a lot of people. It's a big organization. <laughs> it is. I, I stayed with Cheryl Birch. On, oh, uh, yeah. Cheryl is amazing. Yeah. She started the yeah. first IONS group here. Yeah. And, um, and she was involved with ARE for quite a few years. I, be, I believe she was a board member. Yeah. I stayed at her house the last time I was there um does she still have a house there she's still there she still does um her mother has isn't here anymore she's moved her mother out to california with her but um she still has a house here and she comes back every once in a while and so we go out to dinner now and then when she when she comes into town yeah tell her hi if you see her before i do <laughs> okay okay <laughs> wonderful yeah it's a small world right uh okay Let's see. Does anybody else have any more? Are there more questions here that I missed? Oh, uh, someone said, I highly doubt anyone here would think you need a psychiatrist. That's no, those are those were my internal doubts. They, you know, it wasn't anything that I voiced out loud. And um, it was it was just internal doubts. You know, when you when you first go through something huge, drastic changes, you wonder, is this real? And I, uh, you know, <laughs> even to this day, I question, you know, sometimes how, you know, how does this happen? It's amazing. It's wonderful. But like, you know, gosh, you know, but but then when you start looking at things that because I questioned it really seriously until the actually the cancer, because there weren't a lot of veridical elements in my near-death experience, except for the parts about the future. And so when I started living some of those future elements that I saw in my near-death experience, to me, that was the veridical part of my experience that verified that this is this is real. You know, and so I don't question it as much anymore. Um, Grace just added a timely uh, question. She said, do you receive any insights on the U.S. Polit politics since we seem to be engaged in spiritual warfare? <laughs> She's so true. It, it does feel that way. You know, um, no, it's something that it's not my job for some reason. The spirit, that's not my focus with spirit. Um and that's okay. I'm okay with that. Um, I pay attention, though. I, I really feel like, you know, I need to pay attention because, uh, you know, we, we all do. We all have to pay attention. And because I'm very uh, adamant about we're all in this together. In fact, it's kind of interesting that this question, because uh, this is what spirit in my morning contemplations this week. And I'm going to be, I, I have a podcast that I do on YouTube every Sunday morning. And that's kind of the subject that we're going to talk about is, um, is we're all in this together. And, um, and so how can we fortify ourselves so that we can do everything that we can um, in our lives, you know, and with, because it all starts with us, you know, and so how can we fortify ourselves, nurture ourselves so that we have the strength in order to you know, forge ahead and to make a better life. Because I'm, I'm a firm believer and I don't so much try to forecast the future because I feel if I do everything I can in this moment and be the best I can be in this moment, that I'm forging the best possible future I can. Right. Also, um, if, it, you know, there's, we do have free will and so the future is flexible sure is sure is and um <laughs> i like i like going down the windy road so uh yeah <laughs> i like to squeeze all the juice out of life so um you sure do <laughs> why Great. not 
Great. Greg asked, uh, did your future insights relate to the age of Aquarius and the changes that are coming? Again, I'm not real good on, um, I'm not sure what you're referring to as age of Aquarius. I understand that we're at the cusp, the beginning of the age of Aquarius, um, and that there's supposed to be this greater awareness that's coming to us and everything. And I believe that that a lot of the turmoil and change that's going on right now is a precursor for the change and for a greater realization for humanity's greater realization. But I, because I think that a lot of times, um, when do we fight things the worst is when we don't when you know, there's many people that don't like change. And so they're going to hang on for dear life. You know, they're going to grasp. And what it the Buddhist teaches, you know, not to grasp, to grasp things lightly and allow it to flow. But, um, but, you know, many people don't feel that's not their philosophy. Many people like it the way it is. And I want to keep it that way until the day I die. And so, you know, they're, they're not flexible. If anything, a spiritual path teaches you to be flexible because the minute you accept a spiritual path, the universe is going to throw some rocks in the path just to see how you react. That's just, that's just part of our growth and how we, how we get past those obstacles, how we navigate through life is part of the growth. It's part of the us coming back to our higher consciousness, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I I, I think of the, the the spiritual process. It's like going to the gym. We come to the Earth School to learn lessons because we evolve more quickly by betting our heads against the negativity that's here. Uh, like when someone goes to the gym and they use the machines, they get stronger faster. So I, I feel that kind of what happens to us with the, with the lessons that we we get to, by battering our heads against the negativity absolutely absolutely um i see craig has asked and, and people have referred back to you know speaking more about are are is the association for research and enlightenment um and it was founded by edgar casey so if you've ever read any of the Edgar Casey work, he was uh, he, he was called the sleeping prophet. And, and he was actually the father of holistic medicine. He started a holistic hospital before holistic was even a word to most people. You know, I mean, so he um, he was a groundbreaker and and he had thousands in the library at ARE, there's thousands of his readings that are available and people have been studying them for forever. And um, <clears throat> my wife is a student of, of Edgar Casey, and she's one of the teachers. She, she does conference teaching and stuff like that. And, um, and so, you know, people think of him as a psychic, people think of him as a healer, people think of him as, um, and he had, he had business advice, he had, you know, a lot of just general type readings and things like that, but Edgar Casey. so um, the ARE is founded on the principles that Edgar Casey kind of laid down in his readings and stuff, but they continue on today you know they're they're constantly evolving and growing in fact they've just uh, gone through a, a, a administrative change just recently and um <clears throat> but it's a huge organization here it's based here in virginia beach but they have groups just like are they have groups all over the world and um and so they uh <clears throat> they have monthly conferences and things like that and they're simulcast uh, over the web but they, um, ARE is, is um, on the campus, they have the, the main uh, building, which is, they call it the Welcome Center, but it's, it's, it houses a bookstore, it houses the Casey Library, which is the second largest, this is what I'm told, the second largest metaphysical library outside of the, the Vatican. And so this library is huge. It's a great, if you really want to do spiritual research, it's a great library to go to. Um, and then um, also there's the Atlantic University is on the campus and they have, they offer all kinds of, uh, of and it's an accredited college. 
Um, there's also a, uh, <clears throat> the original hospital is now a healing, there's a spa and healing center there, along with a fam fabulous restaurant called, uh, that we all, that we all go to now and then. Um, and so there's, a, you know, the ARE is a huge organization that is global. It's worldwide, um, hundreds of thousands of members. Um, I think, Marsha, you, you said you're a member. Um, I don't know if there's anything you want to add. You're muted. Sorry, uh, Marsha, there you yeah. go. But it is a neat organization. I started reading Edgar Casey, I think, when I was around 17 or 18. And I've never been there. I would love to go. They do a lot of wonderful programs. Um, they have a great website. If you become a member, um, they have all different kinds of things, books, everything. So I'm going to get there. <laughs> <laughs> would be good to do. <laughs> yes. Okay, anybody else have any any last minute little tidbits to add? I think we're pretty pretty well down the road here. That was absolutely wonderful, David. Thank you so much for coming and sharing with us. I'm I'm sorry it took me so so long to make it happen, but I'm certainly glad we we did make it happen and I really 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 appreciate it. Thank you Everything very much. Everything in its time, right? You know, everything in its exactly. proper time. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't think there's any question about that. That's a for well, it's sure. It's been an honor for me to come and, and talk to Chicago <laughs> and your online community. And <clears throat> We ended up with, I think, 36 people, which is not bad considering the rough bump we had this morning. So Yeah, yeah. Quick question. Oh, this is Craig Rodick. Um, is there an AR, ARE group in Chicago? Does anyone know if that's- Yes, there yes, there is. Yes, there is. And uh, Ron Hounsel was in charge of that for a while. I don't know if he's still doing it. Uh, they, they, their headquarters were, was it, is it Des Plaines? Does somebody know? Um, I spoke to them once, um, but it, it does exist, yes. Thank you. I think, um, Craig, that they may have had something at Unity Church and Des Plaines for that. I know okay. they have a bookstore, so I'm not sure if it's still going on, but it was. There, I'll do a Google search and see what I found. There was, they had another site, too. It moves, it's moved around a little bit, but Ronald Hounsel, H-O-U-N-S-E-L-L, -L -L, was in charge of it for a while, and I, I don't know if he still is. He did live in Evanston. So you might uh, be able to find his contact info and talk to him about it. He would be able to tell you. His name's really familiar. I'm sure that he's uh, talked here in Virginia Beach. Yeah. It's really funny. He was, uh, Ron was an assistant to my husband who was uh, formerly music critic of the Chicago Tribune. But he, he also taught at Northwestern and when he was at, um, Northwestern, Ron was a teaching assistant for him in some of his classes. I was in the first class that my husband taught at Northwestern. <laughs> That's how I met him. <laughs> you just never know how these things are gonna happen. Yeah, it's all, it's all connected. Everything, yeah. <laughs> everything is connected. I just, we are all one. <laughs> it's true. I just, I don't know if you can hear me or not, but I just found out that the uh, Unity Displays Church is run by volunteers from the Chicago area team at the ARE, Edgar Casey Association for Research and Enlightenment. Wow. There you go. So that displays unity. Um, there you go. So wonderful. It looks great to renew that connection. And um, uh, everything. It was just terrific. Thank you so much. Don't forget next month we have Rhonda and David Ings, who, who are both near-death experiences, will be presenting for us. And so to see you next, uh, December, I believe, on Saturday, December, we're always on the second Saturday of every month. So please join us and um, 
also you should know that all of our meetings are recorded and they are on our website within a short time after the meeting. So they're accessible. So if you didn't see the whole thing or if you wanna share what you heard today with somebody else, you can refer them to our website uh, under events videos, events slash videos. So um, it will be there later. So um, you're welcome, Jane. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and, and for persevering and being brave enough to, to look again for the for the, the, the uh, connection Zoom length, which was delayed. And I don't know what happened. Something happened to, we use eye contact for a server. And um, something happened uh, with it and, and things were not doing what they were supposed to do. And so uh, I'm somehow it got confused and garbled, but we got it straightened out and we're all good and we had a great time. So thank you again. Um, have a good month, everybody. Live long and prosper. God bless you all. Thank you so